was until up in the Oregon case, one of the attorneys circulated an email to me and said, hey, do you know this Roger Roots guy? And my answer was, no, I have no idea. And uh, Roger was part of Ryan Bundy's uh, defense team up there. And I did a little research on Roger and I thought, holy cow, there are people more colorful than me. So <laughs> I, I have to say, Roger, um, uh, you, you've outdone me, so I don't think I need to even really um, qualify anything I have to say. Um, but uh, you know, it's a funny thing, liberty's a colorful thing. And um, you know, years ago, I thought I was awake. Years ago, I thought I was part of the liberty movement, and uh, I was helping people put on seminars, and I was going to seminars, and I was doing things, and, and I really did think that I was awake, and I, I was you know, trying to make a difference and do things, and matter of fact, I, I got so frustrated that it seemed like progress was so slow, I just decided I was going to dedicate myself 100% to the liberty movement, and a group of friends and I got together, and we decided we'd create three things for the liberty movement. In order to really see the liberty movement succeed, we needed we to have go, a Nancy. bank that was independent of our banking system. We needed to have a school or a system of schools that was independent of our government-run school system. And we needed to have a newspaper or we needed to have an organ or a, a way to get our voice out. And obviously we didn't invent these ideas and there are a lot of people that were doing pieces of these things and we looked to them for examples, etc. But uh, we started on that path um, now about 15 years ago and uh, we created those things, and uh, we were somewhat successful. Uh, we organized about 28,000 people who were meeting on a weekly basis, um, doing political action. We had a private university and a private academy, K-12 academy. Um, we were growing, and we built a private uh, bank, basically, uh, with, and we started with zero. We started all this with nothing, and uh, we got to the point where we had about $100 million, we had about 200,000 people who were um, supporting in some way or the other. I started a radio program, had over a million listeners just on iTunes radio. Well, I really thought I was something. And I think that's when the, you start to learn your next lesson. Uh, I will spare you that whole story, except for to say, um, I think I'm more awake now than I was then. Um, when you start to do things that rattle the enemy's cage, uh, the enemy lets you know. And uh, as Roger said, I was indicted uh, by the federal government uh, back in 2009. It was a political cause. I knew it was political. And um, I had ticked off some people uh, on purpose uh, in the political sphere. And they decided to see which one of us was teaching the other one a lesson. And uh, to make a long story short, um, everything uh, was spent to fight that fight. Our business, is, uh, our business was spent. Uh, my personal relationships were spent. In some circles, my reputation was spent. Uh, my first wife left. Uh, my best friends left. Uh, not because we didn't share love and affection or feelings, but when the enemy comes for you, it is brutal. And as we have seen here with the Bundy family, what an amazing family. What an amazing example of loyalty, even just within a family. Uh, when the government came after all of these men and put all of them in prison, it would not be uh, atypical for it to turn family member against family member because it's scary, it's hard, it's brutal. And I know the people in this room and the people that are watching probably know something of that. And uh, I have to say, the fight that I have uh, waged uh, in, in defense of not just my own name and the people who work with me, but in defense of uh, freedom and free enterprise and entrepreneurialism, uh, it has taken a toll. The first toll is I'm about 100 pounds heavier and now I wear a cowboy hat. So <laughs> you, you get some positives and negatives along with that. I guess you know if you have to choose a cowboy hat and 100 pounds, that's what you take, right? And a beard. I didn't wear a beard back then either. Um, uh, that was kind of funny, you guys. It's all right. Laugh. Um, but, but here's the point. Um, in the process of this whole thing, one of the things I realized and how I got involved with the Bundy situation is you know, I knew people. I knew political leaders. I rubbed shoulders with um, all the visible political forces that you see. I had the major presidential candidates at my home and in my businesses. Um, so nationally and statewide, I was you know, climbing that ladder. But I wasn't awake because there's something that I didn't realize. And it goes back to something that Neil uh, was teaching a little bit earlier. And 
in the cause of liberty, we've transitioned. Uh, you know, I, I've grown up and I always hear people say, well, someday this is going to happen. Someday it's going to get so bad that A, B, and C are going to happen. And most often what I find myself today saying is, no, we've slept through most of those some days. Those things have happened. Most of us have been asleep. And, and we're starting to wake up and we're saying, hey, it might be time to fight. And I say, no, no, it's almost too late to fight. It is almost over. And, and that should strike some urgency. At least it struck some urgency to me. And I'll, let me just give you a simple example. One of the things I realized about this Bill of Rights is it's not political. If you still think the Bill of Rights is a political tool to structure debate and to pass legislation and to advocate, you've missed the point. Because where the rubber meets the road with liberty is in a courtroom. And if those courtrooms fail, and they are failing, but if those courtrooms completely fail, it's just bullets. That's the only place left. The Bill of Rights is the insurance that every person in this room can stand on their own two feet and go to court and say, I'm going to fight for myself. I'm going to stand up and fight for my freedom. And, and people don't realize that. And we don't realize, and to a large extent, the people who love liberty, we kind of like to mind our own business. And uh, the collectivists and the statists, they, they've got an advantage of us naturally because they like to hang out and make group decisions and oppress people with force because that's kind of what's cool for them. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek facetious, but people who love liberty tend to be kind of your lone wolf, I can do it on my own, leave me alone sort of folks. And if you do have relationships, they're close friends and family, and that's about it. But you see, we've missed something. And for now, three generations, as far as I can calculate it, we've abandoned the courts. We don't speak the court's language. We don't understand the court's procedures. And by the time we find ourselves engaged in it, it is such a foreign world, the only thing we know how to do is protest. The only thing we know to do is to say, this sucks. This isn't fair. This isn't right. But I will tell you, the thing I learned is, and the people who say that unjustly and sadly, all, almost statistically speaking, all follow the same ritualistic slow march to the gallows. In other words, there is no victory in being victims to tyranny. Let me say that again. Standing, what I've learned is standing up and proclaiming loudly that you're being victimized by itself does nothing to slow the forward march of the tyrants. In fact, People like Dan Love keep kill books and gleefully gloat when we squeal and talk about how badly we are oppressed. You see, we have to wake up and realize, one of the things you probably don't know, this little humble casual fellow over there in the plaid shirt, he is the only privately retained attorney on this case as of right now. And I'm not insulting any of the other attorneys here. I could compliment each of the other attorneys on this case, but I want to talk about this guy in the green plaid shirt over here. He hasn't put a single Bundy family member in hawk for his legal services. He hasn't required them to sign. Yeah, bravo. He hasn't required them to sign mortgages to their home or legal agreements that entitles him to lien their assets, which is what every American is faced when they come into the justice system and are charged with a crime. They are faced with the option of either hiring an attorney and taking every resource they can get their hands on, including leaning every asset they possibly have and still possibly losing, likely losing, or give in and say, oh no, please, please provide me with an attorney because I'm indigent. And our legal system has gotten there, and I, I won't be popular for saying this, but in large part because we've been asleep. By opting out of the process, by not learning how to win, and by becoming specialists in whining and complaining, for three generations now, that system has tilted and tilted and tilted and tilted so far towards tyranny that the Bill of Rights almost doesn't matter in a court of law, in a criminal court of law in our federal system. Now I say almost because that's the silver lining. And I'm not a glasses half empty kind of guy, but I am a realist. And we don't have a glass half full. We don't have a glass a quarter of the way full. We've got a little bit of water that's still covering the bottom of the glass. 
And if all we do is still whine and complain and think that someone's going to get elected president and change it, or someone's going to get elected governor or attorney general or whatever and change it, we don't have much time before there's not even that water left. And you see what, what had to happen, and I'm actually grateful that it happened to me, is you can make or raise or gather millions of people. You can organize tens of thousands of people. Others have done it. Right, Errol. They've gone before. You could name. Everyone in here could pick your favorite organization. From the Orthodox, right, the conservative organizations like the Heritage Foundation and uh, the Republican Party, uh, or even take the liberal side of things, the ACLU, and um, uh, you could take, for a hundred years, there have been organizations who say they fight for liberty. And yet we all know, without a doubt, that the cause of liberty has not won a single decade. The movement for liberty hasn't gotten stronger since 1913. Not once. Not one tenure period has the cause of liberty slowed down the growth of federal government, state governments, local governments. Not once has the Bill of Rights become something that the average citizen, Cicero used to say a liberal education was the ability to stand before any court and defend yourself based on your own rights. We now say a liberal education is sex education and socialization and making sure kids are well adjusted. But you see, one of the things, I don't know if you guys were in court with Ryan Bundy, but one of the things you've got to learn is a liberal education, doesn't matter whether you're 99 or not, is when you can stand on your own two feet and defend liberty in a meaningful way towards victory. And you can do it still in courts. There's still a little bit of water covering the glass. We can't win the fight in the courtroom. We can't win for the cause. But where it's getting taken from us, where we get put in prison, it's in the courtroom still, thankfully. Thankfully. And it's not even true for all of us. Some people don't even, and I, that sounds crazy, but you all know, there are some people who aren't getting to court. But most of us still can have our day in court. But what good is your day in court if you can't use it? And this is what I learned. And I've been fighting the federal government for 10 years. They indicted me. Well, first the state came after me in 2005 to 2007. We beat that. They indicted me in 2009, we beat that. They indicted me again in 2009, we beat that. They indicted me again in 2013, we beat that. Then I got involved in the Bundy case and they decided to indict me again. And they took me to trial last year and there was a mistrial, in October, uh, August through October, and there was a mistrial. So then I got involved in the Bundy case down in Nevada and they said, oh boy, we better go retry him again. So now they're gonna retry me again. You can scour my Facebook, you can ask any friend of mine, and you won't ever hear me complain about that. And you might say, well, why? And I go, because I'm not giving them the satisfaction of hearing one word complaint. I'm not. I'm not on the earth to earn your pity. And none of us are on the earth to earn each other's sorrow and condolences alone. Obviously, good friends mourn with those who mourn and stand with those who are in need. I'm not saying we don't do that. But I'm saying that by itself doesn't win this war, and we can win. And when I got involved in the Bundy case up in Oregon, and I brought someone named Morgan Philpott on board, and then I brought someone named Marcus Mumford on board, and we came nice. on board and we went up and met those attorneys, I will tell you, we would go to those attorney meetings and they would look at us like the biggest motley crew and say, what are you talking about? I remember we went to, we went to dinner in the early days, and I can't talk about too much about what's happening in Nevada right now. But I can talk a little bit about what happened in Oregon that you don't know. I remember going to dinner early on, and Matt Schindler said to Morgan and I and Marcus Mumford, so why are you guys here? You guys aren't even getting paid. And I said, no, we're getting paid. But we're just getting paid by those who give. And I don't, you know, again, I'm a capitalist. My moniker is a free capitalist. So there's a whole different conversation here about capitalism we'll have later. But, but we went up there because we weren't going to grind the face of the poor. We were going to press these men and their families who were in prison. But we were up there. And he says, you know, I'm getting paid by the government X amount of, you know, a week. And he says, why are you guys here? And I said something that I'll never forget. It was the simplest answer to a question. I said, well, Matt, we're here to win. He choked so hard, I thought... What he was drinking was going to come out of his nose. And he goes, 
<laughs> you guys are crazy. He said, he said, now we have a Ponzi schemer, because that's what I'm accused of being, right? They label you, right? Domestic terrorist plan. Whatever they can label you, they'll label you. And then people who are brain off, they, they just adopt those labels and apply to you. Because now we've got a Ponzi schemer who's going to come up here and tell us we can win this trial. And I, I remember where we were standing. I could take you to that place in Oregon, outside that restaurant on that sidewalk. He had a friend there, and he looked at us. He thought we were delusional. And he turned to Mumford, to Marcus Mumford, and he said, Get a load of this guy. Did you hear what he just said? He thinks he can win. And Marcus goes, yeah, that's, that's why we're here, to win. And he turns to Morgan, look, is there any sanity for you three? No, no sanity for many of us, because we really believe we can win. Why? Why? See, and this is kind of the point. We live in a time where it seems like we're being sold make-believe all the time. You watch the movies, you watch the news, you watch it's all make-believe. We believe, but, but what's funny is we're prone to believe make-believe, but we won't believe basic principles. Let me give you an example. How many of you guys have seen the movie, or the, the first or the second one, called National Treasure, with Nicolas Cage, right? Rich? We love those, they're cool, right? Because the theme, and there's lots of them, you can go to clear back to Harrison Ford in, uh, the third movie of the Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, right? We love these stories where there's some ancient wisdom that is discoverable if we apply our mind. And it's kind of the everyman who applies his mind, right? Harrison Ford in, in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, he's kind of your everyman, right? Same with Nicolas Cage in, in, in um, National Treasure. He's got this everyman persona. And it's this idea that you can apply your mind, and there might be these secrets out there, left by some ancient people who are all dead, and if you know the secrets, you know how to read the right code or put your hand <clears throat> under the right rock, and somehow in all those movies, and somehow there's this mechanism that survives that saves the world, right? If you can, if the, only the penitent shall pass, you don't get your head cut off if you remember to be humble, right? That's a principle. <laughs> and we're like, but hey, I knew that. I knew that. I, I might be able to go find. Oh, 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 look at look at all those rich goblets. That's not the Holy Grail. Oh yeah, yeah, he has chosen. <laughs> we love because we live in the fantasy, as Shakespeare says. We mind true things by what their mockeries be. We find that easy because we have inside of us a desire to believe that there's some secrets, there are some truths that if we just adhered to them and knew them, we could win. But we only believe it in the movie. Because when I went to Oregon and I started telling even my brothers in prison, hey, we can win. They said, no, we can't. I said, no, no, we can win. Well, I don't, we can win the larger cause. We're going to be a great example. I said, no, we're going to win. We're going to get you out of this prison. You're going to walk out these prison doors. And even the best among us have a hard time believing that it's still possible to win. Now, we don't win every time, of course. But I've dedicated my life, lately, to learning that if we're going to really advocate for liberty, before we have a bank, before we have a school, before we have a newspaper, we've got to be able to stand on our own two feet in the last refuge of the courts and defend liberty. Because if we don't do it there, it will finish failing. And then only bullets will bring liberty back. Some people believe we're already there. Some people believe that. Some very sincere people already believe that. I don't believe that. I've tried to prove that. I had hoped that by our victory in Oregon, and it wasn't just Morgan and I and Mumford, by the way, people like Roger Roots, people like Ryan Bundy, people like Shauna Cox, people like the lawyers on that team. You know, all those lawyers... They came around because they want to believe. But a lot of those lawyers are what we call CJA lawyers. I don't know if you know what that means. And I don't mean to get too long-winded, but let me just give you another build-up on the Bill of Rights real quick. Until about the 1930s, most criminal charges didn't come in federal court. They all came in state court because we actually didn't have the tyranny that we have now. We, we had it in space, but it just wasn't as bad as it is now. So most crimes were charged at the state level. But as the criminal code started to grow and more and more crimes were charged at the federal level, the Sixth Amendment, people, people say, well, we didn't, we didn't used to guarantee people lawyers. Oh, yeah, we did. Even in the 1930s, there was a big case where we guaranteed you, because of the Sixth Amendment, a lawyer if you could find one. 
We would even appoint one for you, but we wouldn't pay for them. And so you can imagine how that went. And then in the 1960s, we passed a law, not long ago, we passed a law called criminal just uh, an amendment to a law called the Criminal Justice Act, where the federal government started to say, well, since we're paying for your oppressors, we'll pay for your defenders too. And people cheer, and to this day they cheer. And there's a federal defender office now in every federal district. And then there's a CJA panel, which are attorneys who get appointed, basically, or hired by the courts to help defend people who can't pay for their own lawyers. And on one hand, it is a great blessing, no doubt about it. On one hand, it's a great blessing, but on the other hand, let me tell you what a courtroom looks like when you walk in. Roger and I were talking about this not long ago. When you walk into that federal building that's paid for by the federal government, and you meet your accuser, right, it's a federal prosecutor, not mentioned in the Constitution, by the way, Founders never imagined federal prosecutors, a permanently paid class of lawyers who do nothing all day but prosecute crimes. Never, never in a free society, that's absurd. We now have it from top to bottom. We are sick. We have city prosecutors now. We, oh, a different lecture for a different day. But you go in there and you meet your prosecutor, and where do they get their paycheck? Obviously from the federal government, right? And you go to the judge, and you meet the judge, and the judge, even in a federal court appointed under Article Three, leave aside all the other arguments, where do they get their paycheck? from the federal government, right? And then you meet your attorney, who they appoint for you. It's like an arranged marriage. You don't get a list of CJA bar attorneys and get to go interview them and see if any of them will actually defend you. Their friends in the judiciary or colleagues pick them and reward them. And I mean reward them because, you know, lawyers who are on the CJA they have to play nice or they don't get picked. And if they get picked, they get paid. Now, I've, I've met tremendous CJA lawyers. Tremend I've met tremendous federal defenders. I'm not criticizing all of them. But you understand, even the best men and best women in a broken system can suffer the results of the broken system. Now, if everybody's getting paid by the federal government, the jury, when they come in, who do you think they identify with? Because, of course, they've been trained, taught, and educated that the government's the good guys. So there's one odd person out in the whole courtroom, and it's the defendant. Now, in 1980, about 81% of federal criminal cases resolved in plea bargains. <coughs> By 2017, 98.8% of all federal criminal cases end in plea bargains. Even then, You've got about a quarter of a million people every year get this arranged marriage of a lawyer appointed to them to go fight for them in court. About 1% of them actually go to trial. And out of that 1%, 9 out of 10 are convicted. Why? Well, because the only people usually who are willing to go through the hell of pretrial detention, the abuse, the torture, psychological torture, there are only two categories of people usually who will go through that. The people who have nothing to lose because life is over, right? They're facing 20 years or more in prison. Or, or the people who actually say, no, I'm not guilty. But think about that. Our whole system where liberty meets the road, where the liberty rubber meets the road, is in maybe 20 to 30 trials a year in a country of 300 million people. You mentioned the Fifth Amendment, due process. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of what's happening here. But when, we, when, you, when you hear in the news that we're arguing Brady motions and Giglio motions, those are just names of cases, okay? And I'm a good legal researcher, as good as the next guy. But what those cases are, those are Fifth Amendment cases that say, here are the demarcations or the boundary points beyond which prosecutors cannot go. Brady and Giglio is a shorthand way of saying the prosecutors have transgressed the Fifth Amendment. The reason the jury is out right now in the Bundy case in Nevada is because no matter what you say about Judge Navarro, and there's a lot to say about any federal judge, okay, what's happened in court has got her attention. Frankly, because of dang good lawyering and lots of prayers and hope and faith. And she right now is looking at that demarcation line. And we are arguing our 
my 11 year olds here, I can't uh, apologize afterwards, so. <laughs> he says, Dad, I hear it in school all the time. Um, but she's evaluating that Fifth Amendment demarcation line. Now, I'm going to tell you two things. She might come out on the right side, and we might all go home. But obviously, the battle for liberty isn't over. That's one of the scary things. Because a lot of people think this is about the fight to free the Bundys. Even for the Bundys, it's not the fight to free the Bundys. If that was true, Clive and Bundy would be out of jail right now. Because there are some bigger issues at stake. 20 trials a year and shrinking are defining our face-to-face, one-on-bohemoth battle, one-on-legion, one-versus-many battle for liberty. Very few people will fight. Very few people will fight. Thank God that there are men right now who are willing to stand up and fight because when they fight, we get a chance to highlight that demarcation line. If nobody fights, no one looks at the line. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what we do is we fight. Now that's not going to win the day, but that's going to buy us time. It's going to keep our friends out of prison most of the time. Sometimes we will lose. But you cannot win if you don't fight. So fighting lays the groundwork. Now, here's the last thing I'll say. We have a sickness. We have a sickness. And it's the worst kind of sickness. The more you have of it, the less you can see it. We have been trained, taught, and educated by the collectivists, and we don't even realize it most of the time, that to win the fight for liberty... We have to win in two places. Okay. Institutions of power. Okay. And magic. Mysticism. The most die-hard patriots, whether they're on the <coughs> far libertarian left or on the far libertarian right, the most die-hard patriots still think, sadly, that the way we're going to win is change the government. Change the courts. Change the congresses. Change the city halls. Change the county councils. It's a sickness. It's paternalism, where we're little kids, because we've grown up in a society that's largely ignorant of the principles of liberty, and we're looking to our parents to answer our problems. And we have substituted because the families have been destroyed. Nobody knows what a family is. We think family is who you sleep with. We have whole societal debates on what a family is, and we define it by who you're sleeping with. That's the most laughable concept in history. We don't know what a household is. We don't know how to maintain households. We don't even have a clue that the household is the fundamental political unit in a free society. That's where family government happens. That's where tyranny or liberty first makes its roots. Go do an experiment. Just do this one little experiment. Go look up the word, the definition of the word, government. Go back to 1828, Mind look up the word. And then go to Google and look at the word. In 1828, we taught society that government starts with self. It was a verb, govern, to govern. To govern oneself. That's the first meaning of the word government. <laughs> Proper government was first and foremost the government of yourself, education. Then family or household. And it didn't just mean the people that were sleeping together. I know that's crude, but let's just be straight. It meant everyone who lived within a certain dwelling or on a certain property because that proprietor established the rules and the rights and the administration of those rights for those private self-governing people. And if you didn't like it, you became your own man and left. And you established your own household. Family government. That's what they'll say. Noah Webster says government, as in family government. A man governs well who governs his own home first. Right now, our households are like bad versions of country clubs. 
We hang out together, we eat together, we entertain each other. We learn nothing about due process. We learn nothing about fundamental rights. We learn nothing about principles. We delegate every sacred thing we have to the institutions of power that we think will save us. And, and I don't have time to do this, but I can go through every day of the week. Just real quickly, Sunday, for most of the Christian West, was a day devoted to religion. We can debate about whether it should be Saturday or Sunday. I'm not here to do that. But Sunday was generally your day for personal worship. We now delegate it all to the church, and we complain if our pastor is good or bad, if our church is good or bad, if our church does something right or wrong. We do nothing in our home. We don't own it. The best among us get dressed up and go to a church and then complain about it with our friends during the week. Because we think the pastor's bad or the Sunday school teacher's bad or whatever else is bad, and at home we've never had a Sunday school class in our own home. Matter of fact, we think Sunday school is when you sit in a room in a church building and get the scriptures out. Instead of when you look at your son face to face and talk to him about principles on Monday or Sunday or Thursday. And you get out Lysander Spooner and you teach an 11 year old, hey, you want to know what liberty is? It doesn't depend on the government. It doesn't give it to you. Now that's just Sunday. What about Monday? Monday's education. We actually have a debate in our society about homeschool versus government school. Where there is no debate. You either get educated within your home and household, or you delegate to institutions that are controlled by other people. Good or bad. Tuesday, what's Tuesday? That's government. The reason we vote on Tuesdays, nobody even knows this anymore. We just go, we just like, oh yeah, we gotta vote on Tuesdays. Tuesday civics. We don't even know what civics are anymore. Because civics are what happened at the town hall and the city council. We don't even know. We're supposed to have that in the home. What are you gonna do in the home? Vote. In my family, we have family council. We're horrible at it. <laughs> but we're a lot better than not doing it. And my children learn what it's like to be accountable in front of their siblings and in front of their parents. They learn what due process is. They learn how to not bitch and whine because they're in trouble. They learn how to speak up for themselves. So the first time they learn it isn't when they're 18 and get a speeding ticket and told the cop to buzz off. And now they have to go explain to a judge who they're going to tell to buzz off. Then they're going to go to prison, get a tattoo, and for the rest of their life be labeled by society as an outlaw. I mean, I'm exaggerating, right? But what's Wednesday? I mean, I think go through. You don't know what the days are even for. In elementary school, they said they were named after the gods of Mars or ancient Greek and Roman culture. B.S. We don't even know. Saturday, we, we still know Saturday's recreation day because that's the day you don't work and go play because the socialists and the statists who want us to be trained, taught, and educated to work five days a week, eight hours a day so we get health insurance and so we quit protesting and do all those things and we'd be happy and be like the little hamsters in the wheel. We just know, okay, Saturday's the day off. We're going to play on Saturday. But we don't even organize play at home anymore. We want the government to tell us what the recreation areas are. We want a recreation center paid for by the government. We want sports leagues that are paid for with tax dollars. We don't even know how to play without the two myths, institutional power and mysticism. And I won't, I won't go into mysticism. Mysticism was just magic. I don't know how we're going to solve the problem somehow. If we elect a new president, maybe. If we pass a new law, maybe. If we do something, maybe. Mysticism, just a belief that there's got to be a way somehow. If we get rid of those two things, if we get rid of our belief in the institutions, not forever, if we just get rid of the institutions in our head for a minute, like John Lennon, and imagine for a minute, they're all gone, and we get rid of mysticism, this blind hope that somehow it's just going to be better, and we actually think, then we can start governing ourselves. And that ultimately starts in your home, and for every one of us it will end someday, either in the grave or in a court of law. That's the only way you're going to lose your liberty. There's only two ways to lose it. You're going to start in your home, and it's going to end in a grave or in a courtroom. So we should get prepared to do it. So that's what we do. And then, believe it or not, we don't love being in the courtroom. We don't love what you have to endure to fight the legal system these days. But I'll tell you what I do love. Without doing this, we wouldn't have met people like Neil Wampler, or Ken Mendenbach, or Shauna Cox, or Ryan Bundy, or Ammon Bundy. And we can do something more than those who have gone before us have done. Because as good as they have been, they have failed. Pick a hero. I don't care if you're a John Bircher, or you're if, a, if you're a hippie from the 60s, and uh, you, you still think it was better then. I don't care. Pick your hero. They didn't slow down this tide, the momentous tide of mediocrity that allows tyranny to flourish. But we can. And uh, there are magic 
words that aren't magic. There are relics like the National Treasure movie our founders give them to us. A trial by jury, for example. Don't laugh it off. A trial by jury, as corrupt as our system is, as broken as our system is, 12 people who weren't there last week or last month or six months ago have a much better shot at giving a free man freedom than a professional judge or a professional prosecutor. And we've proven that. And so that's, that's a system, that's, that's, that's the real national treasure. Our founders weren't perfect men, but they put these things in place that as broken as it is, if we dig off the moss and polish it up a little bit and get out our ancient manuscript and figure out how to use it, you can do it. You really can do it. And uh, I, I get tired of the people who are skeptical and say it's too late. Because if it is too late, the only option left is to get your gun and to go hide until they come for you. I'm not ready to do that. And uh, so, I come when Roger Root says, I, I want you to not, let me tell you the truth. I knew there would only be 10 or 20 people in this room. And I knew there would be an audience on Facebook, still smaller than I thought. I was in Grass Creek, Utah. And I put my son in the car. And we drove eight and a half hours. Because I wasn't going to miss it. Because if Roger Roots asks me to stand up for freedom, I'm going to do it. Because I know Roger Roots because he stands up for freedom. And we've been doing it together. And that's what starts to change the momentum. The relationships that are built, the friendships and the trust, when we fight for liberty on principle. Not because we're making money, although there's nothing evil about money, by the way, different conversation, but because we know where we stand. I know something about Roger Roots. I know something about what he prefers to do with his time, and it has something to do with the things I love. So when he says I'm having a Lysander Spooner conference, I, I didn't give him the lecture about how, you know, in the next life I plan to talk to Lysander Spooner and straighten him out on a few things. Um, because go read, turn your brain on. I just give you a challenge, go read two Lysander Spooner essays. Just go read two, any two. And you'll start to be better positioned to govern yourself. You don't agree with him, but it turns your brain on. You start to think and act and choose for yourself. And so, yeah, uh, Roger, I commend you for doing this, and I thank you for the time. And I hope I didn't take too much of it. So, thanks. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks to Rick Kerber. Let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you. Uh, searching for. Now the uh, Constitution of No Authority. Guest on the line. So guess who this is? It's gonna be Gavin Syme. Gavin. Right. Who uh, Gavin. Yeah, I think so. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to introduce this next special mystery guest. This man is in exile. He, uh, well, Gavin Syme needs no introduction, folks. But I just want to say, this man has uh, established a track record of wonderful uh, constitutional confrontations with authority. And I was a fan of his before I ever met him. I, I watched uh, several of his YouTube videos in which he would have little confrontations with police at different stops and checkpoints and uh, all kinds of little things, and he would ask questions. Little, literally, he would simply ask questions. Am I required to do this? What's your authority? And uh, I was a fan of his before I ever met him, and uh, he, of course, has been an activist in libertarian circles, and uh, he has an immense following on the Internet. He also has a lot of enemies, I can tell you that. A lot of people don't like him. They say he, he uh, stirs the pot and causes too much trouble, and he should just uh, not create so much problem for law enforcement. And uh, but I, his uh, his supporters and his fans and his friends vastly outnumber his detractors. I can tell you that. And uh, recently, I learned that that Gavin had uh, gone into exile and left the United States for Mexico. And uh, I hope that Gavin, you can just. Uh, 
talk about that and uh, the man needs no introduction and uh, so I would I would just give it over to Gavin Syme and let's give a big round of applause and have him say a few words about what he's doing and why he's done it and uh, the, the road ahead. Go ahead, Gavin. Hey, Roger. Thank you. I hope you guys can hear me okay. I tried to dial in the uh, connection and I got here and uh, I'll try to keep it loud and clear. I really appreciate uh, you guys. How's the volume? Uh, the message I heard, I, just, I know I just heard Rick. I heard some good stuff there. I'm coming over the speaker phone. I know John's there and you're there. I don't know who else is there tonight, but uh, really appreciate uh, you guys <clears throat> keeping the force going up there. There's been a lot of amazing things happening in these cases. And I think, honestly, it, it's going to go to my point tonight. Um, rumors of my terrified wife from the police of my town because I might have to face accountability have been greatly exaggerated. Thank uh, you. What was happening in the courts in my town had nothing to do with law, accountability, or judicial authority. And quite frankly, as an activist, uh, and I know I'm not the only one that's seen this, and I think those of you that are activists know that at the current rate of decline of uh, liberty in the state that this day is coming for many of you, if not, I hope that you've at least considered it because I've known that uh, kind of in my soul that this day was coming for at least, I would say, a couple of years now. Uh, the louder your voice becomes and the more you refuse to stand down, uh, the, the more you kind of have that feeling, that spirit about you. And, and there's some nights where you, you stand in your front lawn and you look around and you say, are they coming for me tonight? And you wake up in the morning and everything's fine and you press on. And at some point, Unless the tide of the battle turns in the opposite direction, if you do that for long enough, you're going to have to get out of the enemy's range and uh, and kind of redirect. And that's really what what this is all about for me is two things. First of all, I refuse to continue lying down and doing what a terrorist tells me. I refuse to say when push comes to shove, as activists, we go out. And we stand up to the cops, and when push comes to shove, we do what they say, or they lock us in a cage, or they kill us. Obedience, prison, or death is all we have left in the USA most of the time. Now, I've done a lot of activism, and I've had people say I get away with a lot. The fact is, what I do, if you look at all my activist videos, everything I have done and said to police should be something that no one is surprised that I get away with. It should be something that people are exercising every single day. When you have the petulant, lawless, pathetic, cowardly, non-serving, bully terrorists that we have running around flashing blue lights in our country and calling themselves authority, killing our brothers and our mothers and our children from the boys that come all the way down to our family pets, then people say, you shouldn't talk to them like that. That is a nation of slaves. Because I've never laid a finger on a police officer because I'm a man of peace. And I believe that it's the people's heart. And I, I'd like to refer to Rick's statement briefly. Uh, he's talking about government beginning at the family, and that's absolutely right. Because the real reason that we've lost liberty in the U.S. is because people refuse to teach their family the difference between good and evil. And I don't just mean don't kill, don't steal. You know, I mean, a lot of people, there's good people in the state, and we teach our kids the fundamental. But the fact is, if you're not teaching your kids to resist corrupt authority and to speak out against the bully, right? You teach your kids to speak out against the bully at the playground. So why at first would we not teach our kids to speak out against the bully with a gun and a car and a badge? And the problem is that we failed to govern as a family, and because of that, we failed to govern as a nation. And so we come to this point where I was in a freedom, where I spoke out long enough that they're saying, how can we get this? How can we condemn him? How can we demonize him in the media? How can we force him at the point of a gun to play our game? Let's violate his fundamental right to due process by forcing him to give us the password to unlock the phone that we stole from him without a lawful warrant so that we can move around and get the video that he would have released anyhow had we not stolen the phone. And maybe while we're in there, who knows? And at that point, I remember thinking as, this, as these proceedings started many months ago and how they were kind of impeding 
my plans and I was frustrated. I mean, I have a business to run. I have a family to take care of. And it's always frustrating to be in the court system. And I remember talking to God and I'm like, I said, I said, God, I don't know if I should continue complying with it. Should I go into their system? Should I keep doing this if I have the opportunity? I need to know when to get out because I don't want to be in a prison. If you want me there, I said, God, if you want me in a prison, I'll go there. But I don't think I'll be very good there. I don't think I'll be a very good voice from inside a cage. And so if there's another option, give me that option. And just make sure I know. I said, I'll do what you want, but tell me when it's time to go. And then we had another conversation. Uh, and I should be clear, I'm talking to God. He doesn't always uh, just come back and talk to me. I wish it were that way, but I'm not trying to aggrandize myself here. But I'm talking to God, and I say, you know, if they have my phone, I said, God, I'm thinking if they want to force me to unlock that phone, I can't comply with that. And I have to say, now is the time. Now is the time to act. And so I was going along in the hearings, and they were doing their thing, and then they filed that motion to force me to unlock my phone. And I'm thinking of myself standing in a courtroom saying I'm not going to comply with this. And that's the day that they, they lock me in jail on contempt, which they can hold you for indefinitely because there is no law, even though a contempt charge is absurd and has no basis in the common law or any sort of jurisdictional authority, they do what they want. There's people that have spent many, many, many months in jail for contempt. At which point I will be faced to choose, do I take care of my family and press on to the slave and give them that password, or do I say, no, I'm going to stay in jail and, and have myself abused, my voice suppressed? And then I kept thinking about where that trial might go, because there's zero chance I could have gotten a fair trial in my account. There's zero chance the jury wouldn't have known who I was. There's zero chance the prosecution would have let people on there that, that gave a hint of support for me. And the judge was working for the prosecution, as we see in the Bundy case, as we saw in Jeff Weinhaus' case, as we saw in Shaver Cox's case. And so I kept thinking of all these men that I talked to and I tried to help, and I think, finally I said, why am I here? Why do I tolerate this any longer? Why am I saying I'm going to submit to this court? And so I finally said, I'm not, but no, I'm not going to tolerate a judge who is not even a judge. And I mean this in multiple ways. The judge was not only not an elected judge, he was an appointed lawyer, which is also very common, but not only that, he had no lawful authority. And as John Locke reminded us, uh, when a judge steps outside their lawful authority, at that moment they cease to be a judge. So I'm standing before a lawyer who lies and cheats because all he cares about is women. Under the testimony of a cop who I proved and can be proven that he lied in his testimony and his police reports, which were nothing but hearsay and propaganda, before a judge who's not even a judge in any manner of the term. And I said, why, why are we continuing to go before these men? At some point, you have to say no more. And so it's interesting because in saying I'm leaving, I'm going to get out of range of the enemy a little bit, I've learned a great deal. But one of the most important things I've learned is never let people define you as a coward by their terms. Because I've been chased all the way down here by trolls and a few of people who may have even used to support me who say you're a coward because you didn't go before a fake court. You're never a coward because you refuse to walk into the gas chamber. That's an absurd notion. To our founding fathers, the notion that you're a coward because you told the king no would be laughable. It denies the principles of our Constitution. It would not denies the principles of a God-fearing man. It denies the principles of liberty. You don't bow before the enemy unless the enemy forces you to bow with a whip and a gun. And so I don't mean by any of this to, to decry any of our, our prisoners, our political prisoners or the Bundys, because they've had to go along with these courts in many ways. When they have a, when someone has a gun to your head and says, give me your money, it's better to give them your money than to die because you can only choose one hill to die on. But when you can put yourself out of range of that gun so that you can continue a method, so you can continue seeking liberty, I think that you absolutely should. And if I have one piece of advice for people in this room and beyond, and I cannot emphasize this enough, 
is that you shouldn't be afraid to walk away. We have to set aside our fear. Liberty does not come from being afraid. True patriotism is not an allegiance to one's government or the system that has been put in place. True patriotism is a desire for, for your land, but most importantly, your people to be free. And your people being free does not always mean you can just stay hunkered down in your little parcel of land. Just like there's so many groups throughout history that, that have left their homes to go find more freedom, whether it was the Mormons or the colonists. All these people said enough is enough were leaving. And there's many examples of this throughout history. The fact is, Jesus not only said to run or flee or leave or shake off the dust of your feet from the city that persecutes you and won't hear the truth and that hates justice, but the people of God and of liberty have done so throughout history. And every time that I get a little bit down because somebody's on there calling me a coward, which for an activist who tries to be bold and stand up for his family, sure, that stings a little. Every time that happens, I just think that of all of God's people, from David to Moses to Jesus to Paul to the boy Senecom, who all said no, I'm not going to stop and obey, I'm going to leave. And nobody, nobody wants to think of them themselves as a person who will back down from a fight, and that's fine. And I don't really think of myself as that either, because I can tell you this, I have to back down from the fight. I can high ground in the fight. And what the cowards and loyalists that say, obey, 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 are really saying is, courage is submission to the enemy. And that's not courage. Now, I'm not saying everyone needs to same path, but I'm saying that we shouldn't be afraid to walk away. And when I came to Mexico, it is completely different than the United States propaganda would say. And I knew our propaganda was false. I knew our, our immigration propaganda to control us, our terrorism propaganda to control us. I knew these were lies because I knew our own government wanted the terrorists more than any other terrorist group in the world. But I couldn't have imagined how big of a lie it was. Because I've come down here and I'm truly seeing a glimpse of what free market looks like. I'm seeing what a world looks like where somebody goes and they build a cart. And they load the cart with food and they go to the street and sell it without a permit and without permission. And they build a business for their family. And it grows into a restaurant, which grows into two, which grows into three. I found a nation down here where people maybe poorer by our, our standards of fakery and veneer because in the U.S. we have many pretty things and lots of debt to back up those pretty things. So down here, there may be less prettiness and veneer. We look at that as being poor, but I see people who are generally happier. I see people who absolutely have far more personal liberty. And I see, even in one nation, and I'm not saying this is the best place in the world because I know there's corruption everywhere. Certainly there's plenty of corruption in Mexico, but there's many other nations, countries down here in Latin America. There's countries all over the world. But one thing that seems consistent from Latin America and why I chose to come down here is people said there is more freedom. It's different. It's not the regimented, controlled European fascism that we're used to. And that's what the U.S. is. It's not a free nation. You don't have the freedom to do anything. If any one of you in this room go out right now and make some tacos and get a car and drive down the road with it and start selling them, very shortly you will be approached by terrorists in uniform with guns. And if you do not comply and stop selling your tacos, they will steal everything you have, lock you in a cage, and if you defend your rights, you will kill you. Does anyone in the room want to raise their hand and tell me that that is true? Gavin, let me just tell you, you can't see it, but this room is packed. You're talking to hundreds of people here, and not a single person raised his hand. <laughs> well, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to paint uh, rose-colored glasses on, on going somewhere else. And I will post that. I don't want to go too long here, but it's been hard because as awake as I think I am, coming to a place where I don't speak the language, where I'm the intruder, I'm the foreigner, 
I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed of how our country treats the immigrant, the foreigner, the impoverished, the poor. And I unabashedly to people down here that have been abused by this system, people who have been deported, who have businesses and lives and homes, and the government took it to seize everything they have and took it for themselves. I am unabashedly apologetic for America, for the USA, I should say, because all of this is America, I want to be very clear. That just goes to our egos. We call the United States America. The United States is not America. The continent is America. That's the not true. This is, is America. A, part, a country in the United America. States is a corporation. Mexico, Mexico as it's pronounced, We're called is American. every bit as America as the U.S., and don't get me wrong, I love my country. I want the USA to be free. I uh, want United it to be States restored. States. And I will keep pushing that message. But the fact is, the people are not awake. Even the country our and a continent. Movement, we're pretending. We want freedom. We want constitution. But at the same time, we don't. We say, I want the constitution. I want my right. But how dare that employer hire an illegal immigrant? He should be fined and put in jail for that. That's how we stop illegal immigration. And I say, wait a minute. You can't have a free market. You can't have liberty if you don't have the right to hire whoever you want. Well, he's illegal. And I say, well, our founding fathers did not even understand or relate or speak of that notion because there was no such thing as an illegal. And they say, well, you're for open borders. And you want our culture to go away. And I say, our culture was based on everyone else coming here. Everyone was welcome to walk across that border. Has anyone watched a John Wayne movie? When John Wayne rode across the Mexican border, there was never a checkpoint, a DHS officer or a gun pointed at his head. And I guarantee you, if there was, he would have told them to shove it up their rear. Because that notion is incompatible with the thought of a free man. And so we say, well, how do we protect our borders? We'll look to the founding fathers. Because the number one immigrant in 1780, in 1790, in 1800, shortly after we had formed our Constitution, for better or for worse, the number one immigrant was the British, who we had just come from war with. And we didn't say restrict their immigration because they might be here to terrorize us. We said, no, the government's limitation shall be in this, to have regulation over the power of naturalization, that is citizenship, because the citizen then has the right to vote and to theoretically take part in the usurpatory control over the government, which is still unlikely if the people are engaged. When I left the country, I was at Bundy Ranch that Saturday in April, and it was, it was up till recently the scariest day of my life. Maybe it's right up there still, because those of you, some of you in this room, I'm sure, were on the ground at Bunny Ranch that day. That was and, and I know that we thought we were going to die that day. And as all of these leaks that have been coming out back up the snipers and the drones in the air and all the force that they were seeking, it actually backed up. The years have washed away that fear, and I thought maybe I was exaggerating, but then all these leaks have been coming out, and I'm She's like, not no, here tonight. we weren't exaggerating. Our government's that bad. And I think of Waco, and I think of Ruby Ridge, and I think of the largest prison population in the world. And I say, no, we weren't wrong. And I look at the comments of the naysayers saying, you should have complied with the court and see what happens. And I say, no, I wasn't wrong. Because God gives us an opportunity to continue for liberty. And I think a lot more of you are going to have to leave before this is over. And I hope that someday the USA can be restored. But it will not be until the current system collapses. Because as long as we have the current blue line, the current politicians, the current enforcement, the most constitutional congressman or senator that we have in the entire USA will not even show up and stand up beside us when we're being abused. That says everything you need to know. Not one officer will defend our right and refuse to arrest us when we exercise it. We don't have liberties and we don't have freedom. And so when I came down here to this culture shock of not being able to speak the language and having no idea what to do, and everything was different, and the roads were smaller, and the buildings were more beat down, and I'm like, is this a slum? And then I realized, no, these people just live simpler. There's certainly nice things, and you can go to the big city, and you can go to Little Caesars if you need your marital fix. <laughs> and for the record, the Little Caesars pizza down 
down here actually kind of tastes decent. It doesn't taste like cardboard. Because, <laughs> as a side note, their skies are not filled with chemtrails, and their food is not chemically processed garbage that's approved by the central government. Because anyone can go start a taco truck, cut up a steak, and make you a taco. And their tacos are absolutely amazing. But in, in closing, I'm just trying to kind of paint a little picture for you guys, and I'm going to continue doing streams and videos. If, if I die down here, it will probably be because my government, my own government, came after me for exposing their propaganda, as usual, as a lie. And I don't know how long I'll be here, and, and I hope that we can find freedom at home. But I've been in this fight for years, and I'm not seeing a growth of freedom. We look at a case like the Bundys, and we say, well, look, they're losing the case. They're winning. They're winning. All these things are coming out. And it's amazing that things are being leaked and coming out, and the government is being confounded in their evil and their foolishness. But this is one case. Most defendants that are being railroaded don't have the benefit of tens of thousands of people that are supporting them. The Jeff Winehouses and the Schaefer Talks, they didn't have lawyers and people rooting through information. They didn't have whistleblowers. And so for the thousands and tens of thousands and the millions of people in prison that had no one, they just sit in the cage. And even if the case is dismissed on Monday, the Bundys haven't won because there's still no justice. Because the prosecutors who abuse them and the BLM agents who abuse them are not punished and will not be. If they didn't punish the murderers of Waco, do we really think that they're going to punish the prosecution for their malicious and false accusations against the Bundys in this in this current world? It's not it's not going to happen. Now there will be justice eventually. And someday maybe we can give these men the due process. Not the lynch mob, but the due process they deny that. But in the meantime, we have to be vigilant. And being vigilant for liberty does not mean hunkering down, waving our flag, sticking it in the ground and saying, I won't budge. This has to be freedom the way I want. Right. I serve a God that says, you don't, you don't get to have it your way. You get to have it my way. So just be open-minded and be, be aware and pay attention. And I can say this for all the professions, and I really mean this. The level of freedom they have down here over what we have in the USA is pretty mind boggling. So thank you all. Thank you for listening. And uh, I just uh, keep spreading the message. It's not about fear. It's not about cowardice. It's not about even a refusal to stand and, and answer and get due process. It's that in the USA we no longer have it. And to restore it, we must say no more. Thank you. All right. That's all right. Uh, whereabouts in Mexico are you? Are you just traveling, or have you uh, located a place to sort of hang around? Uh, we're traveling and exploring. Uh, we're in San Luis Potosi State right now. It's on the eastern seaboard. And uh, just for the record, my comment about the desert wasteland was, of course, a joke. It is, it is a paradise down here. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, and we're, so we're over there now. Mexico is smaller, but I'm beginning to wonder if we actually have, if they actually have more usable land down here because there's so many areas that are mountains and snow in winter. I mean, the, the climate and the land and the quantity of agriculture and resources on the land uh, is truly blowing my mind. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Gavin. Hope to see you again. Hey, we'll talk soon. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk, hope to see you soon. On, on one side or the other, you know, uh, you, you know where to come. Thank you, Jack. All right. <laughs> okay, one more round of applause right. for Gavin Sign. Thank you. Right, thanks, folks. I can say there would be some things I can disagree with with Gavin, but I would be more more apt right. to uh, find what we do agree uh, we, upon. We uh, are a little bit uh, rushed for time. We're we're we've got two uh, big potential speakers. I would have, like to have Lou Baker come up and say a few words. Remember, he's the man who's responsible for getting us this venue. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to shut this stream down. Not, and, uh, a lot about it, but uh, 
We'll see somebody else going to pick up. I know David Fleeman's streaming. I think Jamie, you're going to stream the next round? I'm going to stream the next round. He expressed some interest in this event. This charger won't work. And it couldn't have happened without him until he was Lou Baker. No, my barter right here. Oh, it's not? Thank you. And Rick, I got to say that you not only Quote to David speaker, Freeman. but you gave great material. Thanks, uh, And I hope at some point, maybe we can get Gina. together, you can come on the show. I'm the only streamer you see David Fleeman. Global and international. So there's a great potential here for... A, I'll, I'll let it run. I don't know how much data I have, but we'll just let it run. I came here tonight to talk about what you were talking about, I'm Greg, step stepping away. Thank you. The fact that we have to do something that we can't be afraid. And what we found out... Um, it's kind of convenient because I was here and then I'm down the street on 9th Street and so just being here at the federal court and everything else and being able to work with this community here has given me um, a great opportunity to be able to expand some of the ideas that I have. And one of the ideas I have is to not take it anymore. That it's because of the Bundy trial. Yes, I was involved with Bundy before. We had 300 people at the Desert Inn for Bundy, and he became an independent American at that point. We did another one in back of the South Point, and we had about 50 or 60 people. So the Independent American Party is actually behind Bundy and states' rights. Now, what was interesting is that because of the trial here, I learned a tremendous amount about who, what, where, and when. Gloria Navarro, for example, that he was um, officially nominated by Harry Reid, and then he was appointed, or she was appointed, by Obama. Now, this is a really interesting story, but I don't want to get away from the main topic here. The main topic is that because of what's happened here and because of her statements and to the people who had gotten convicted that they had no rights, the only rights that they had was the right of appeal and plead guilty. And then I found out, well, wait a minute, what's, how can that be? This is the Constitution. They have rights, they have the ability to, you know, for, for justice. But no, that's not the case because what we didn't know is all these federal courts are maritime courts, that this is something that they brought offshore because admiralty law, which was the predecessor to the maritime law and martial law, is what caused these people to lose their constitutional rights. She said, and it's been published in the paper, this is valid information that you can find that they had no rights. And I said, well, how can they have no rights? And then I found out about maritime law. And then I started to research that quite a bit and found out that just recently, there have been some rulings that have come down from Scalise. He was the, he read the decision, it was an anonymous decision about admiralty law and some of the events that are taking place here. And I said, well, wait a minute. Um, uh, what, is, what is that? What does that mean? And then I found out something else and trying to do something that you won't find too many people willing to do. And that is create a grand jury. Now what can a grand jury do? Now you can say, how can you create a grand jury? Well, because the Constitution says that you can. That's why. And that you can have, <coughs> there's two uh, qualifications, especially here in Nevada. One, you have to live here for a year, and the second is you have to be a U.S. citizen. That's the two qualifications. <coughs> then, you don't fall under the jurisdiction of any court. Yes, you have certain preliminaries that you have to go through in order to make it legal. But we have, you see, my whole thing about the Bundy thing, and I've been following this from the very beginning, and before that I was following some person who was going to be named and a secret indictment, I hope. And that's exactly where I'm going with this, to find those people who perpetuated this event for the Bundys. Yeah. I know Bundy. I wasn't there the day of the, of the raid, 
and I came up and met him the very next day, and I was very surprised. I was the first first person I ran into was Bundy walking up from the gully, and from there we developed a relationship and so forth. Bottom line is this: we have to do something. Rick, you hit it right on the nose. We have to do something. If we don't do something, we will be under this constant strain forever. And Admiralty Law was meant for the open sea. That's when they created it. And when that meant that the Admiral, the captain of the ship, had complete authority to dispose of mutinies or any other event that was taking place on the sea, guess what? We now have it on land. And it supersedes the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now what that means, and maybe Donald Trump doesn't know this, but he is the, he knows that he's the commander of the Army and Navy, but he doesn't know that he has, he is the captain. See, uh, admiralty law goes back to the king, it came from Britain and so forth. Okay, you have to do your own research. I've done mine, and uh, I, I can't quote it exactly because I'm involved with a lot of things, but the point is that that was part of what we brought from England. And we came here from England, we came on three little ships, the, the Pinto, the Santa Maria, and uh, the other one. And the bottom line is we came here to get away from England and now we're back in the same boat again. We have through government, government corruption, through government treason, we are now in the same position. We don't have a constitutional bill of rights that's been taken away from us and court martial or martial law is real. They can take whatever they want, they can put you away. They don't have to tell anybody where they've taken you. And this is not the way America was created. We can't have two laws that contradict each other. We can't have anything that supersedes the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Nothing can supersede the Constitution or Bill of Rights, except it does and has and is. And if you don't believe me, go into any courtroom, any federal courtroom in the United States, and you're gonna find an American flag with yellow fringe on three sides. That simply says, that they're, you're under ship law. Can we do anything about it? Yes, we can do something about it because we form a grand jury. We indict individuals who have perpetuated this thing. They need to be prosecuted. I'm sure many of you know who I'm talking about, but he's not the only one. There are many people who are involved in this scheme, and it's a scheme that is so wide that you won't really believe it. But we hear about the, about the Democrats and the socialism. We hear about uh, people talking um, talking about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And of course we hear all this, all this to slow down the progress of the United States and bring it back to reality. Well, the, the, the truth is, right now, the reason I came here was to invite anybody who would like to volunteer to become a member of the grand jury to contact me and I will put them with the right people in order for us to get this formed. And we can do it. You can look it up on Wikipedia. You can look it up in the Constitution. You can find out that it is legal for us to act as a grand jury. We can't, <coughs> we can't try anybody. Can't make anybody guilty or not guilty, but we can indict them. And that's what we need to do because we need to start someplace. And with that, I just want to like remind you that when you're going out of here, you can't get back in because they've got the lock set. So you can come in the side door if you want to. But I think we're coming fairly close to a conclusion here. And I would appreciate that you think about it, consider it, and if you have any information that can help us in this process, please give me a call. I'll give my number to anybody who wants it, but you can always reach me at the radio station 983-0711. 983-0711. If you want to volunteer to become a member of the grand jury, please let us know. That is uh, Lou Baker. Find him, Lou Baker. Right. Thanks to Lou Baker. Again, this wouldn't have happened without him. Uh, we've probably down to our last few minutes. I would like to actually invite Morgan Philpot to come up and if you could just say a little bit, maybe maybe give a 
if, if nothing else, uh, a prayer or, or tell us a little bit about your thoughts. Uh, Morgan Philpott, of course, is uh, Ammon Bundy's attorney, along with Dan Hill in this current federal trial that's going to taking place across the street from where we are now, downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. It's the biggest trial in the United States uh, in the past several weeks. I believe this, the, the, the jury was sworn in about two months ago. There's been a jury sworn in two months ago. How many total days of jury trial has there been? Fifteen. Is that right, John? Fifteen. Right Fifteen. Now. Has it been that many? Well, the 15 days of court, but not of actual, the jurors have not been in the room. I, I'm thinking uh, it's yeah. more like three or four days yeah, with the jurors. Nice. Um, but uh, I know, I know uh, Morgan is a tremendous man of faith. Uh, he uh, is from Utah. He previously ran for Congress. Um, I believe uh, he's still young. How old are you, Morgan? I'm pretty old. I'm 46. 46. This man is just entering the prime. This guy could be a future governor of Utah. Right? He could be a future U.S. senator. All right. I have that much sort of respect for him. And if you'd come up, if nothing else, just to give a little, maybe a closing prayer or some, some just a few words, it'd be great. Morgan. And I'm already standing for the standing ovation. Thanks, Morgan. Real, uh, the truth of the matter is the great speaker here is Rick. Uh, there's a reason I associate with that guy, and I think you saw that tonight. Uh, he is indispensable, and really the person who has made uh, this defense possible. Now, how many of you know the story of Ahab? Which Ahab do you think I'm talking about? Not the whale. Not the whale. <laughs> The story from the Bible. How many of you know the story of Ahab from the Bible? And uh, do you remember who his his uh, his nemesis was? Ahab was the bad guy, right? His nemesis was uh, a man named Naboth. And do you remember what Naboth owned? Naboth owned a vineyard, and it was a, a vineyard that Ahab wanted. And Ahab went to Naboth and he said. Can I have your vineyard? And Naboth said, you, you cannot have my vineyard. And he said, I will, I'll, I'll pay you. I'll give you another vineyard. And Naboth said, no. And does anybody know the I was born in Tulsa, said, don't no. I? Come on, somebody's going to know it. He said it was his inheritance from his fathers. And he felt duty-bound to keep that inheritance. And so Ahab goes home. And he's married to a woman who, of course, is named Jezebel. And he begins to lament because Naboth will not give over his vineyard. And so Jezebel says, why are you nice. sad? He says, well, Naboth won't give me his vineyard. And she says, but you're the king of Israel. And she says, let me take care of this. She authors a couple letters. She calls a meeting. She finds a couple conspirators. And that's right, liars. And she asks those two stand conspirators to stand and, and witness, witness against Naboth for right. crimes. And the crime that she asks for them to witness against him falsely is a crime that merits death. And so Naboth's vineyard is taken by treason, treachery, fraud, and murder because Naboth is killed. Sounds like and thus uh, our situation. Into the hands of the king through very unrighteous means. Now, if that story doesn't sound familiar to you, you might be in the wrong building. <laughs> uh, but that's why we're here, right? And it's part of what we're fighting against today. Now, I have a challenge for you. I spent, you know, from the time I was well, let me let me give you a little background. Uh, I was an anthropology major. I studied anthropology and environmental studies. And with that, I became an intern at the White House under Bill Clinton. I was all ready to become a, a good liberal. And I went to this White House internship and I realized that that was not my place. That's not where I was meant to be. And so after graduating college, does anybody know what an anthropology and environmental studies major does? <laughs> liberal stuff. Liberal stuff. Actually, they sell cars. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. You know, because there's nothing else for a person with that degree to do unless you want to go on and get a PhD, which takes quite a long time, actually. So I started selling yeah, you cars. You sell coffee. Yeah, you can sell coffee. I was selling cars and I was miserable. And so I decided I was going to do whatever I could to pursue a path that I felt passionate about. And so I ran for public office at the age of about 28. And I became a state representative. And this was you know, almost 20 years ago. And I spent two terms in the Utah State Legislature and realized very quickly that Rick was absolutely correct. Right, that it, we could not rely upon institutions and people to save us from our own neglect. It was going to take family. And that, that truly was the answer, self-government and family government to save America. So I have a challenge for you. You know, when this trial is over, and I have great hope and faith that it will end favorably. Yes. There's another case you need to be a part of. And there's gonna be another case after that and another case after that. And the next case I'm going to go be a part of Yay. is the case of my good friend Rick over there. And we need to win that case. Yes. Because finding people like you and like Rick is rare. It's a rare thing today. Most people don't do what you do. If a guy like me were thrown in jail, nobody like you would be standing out in front of the courtyard for a guy like me. I'm just a lawyer. We need to keep this group going. We need to go and save our brothers and sisters who have been held captive by a government which has embraced improper principles because the people of America have led it. And I think if we will continue this effort, if we'll continue it for people like Rick, if we'll continue it for anybody else we meet who thinks about liberty the way we do, or loves liberty as much as we do. As we begin to liberate those captives, the spirit of liberty will be perpetuated, and it will grow, and it will ignite flames, brush fires of freedom, as Samuel Adams said. And we'll find ourselves with a lot more friends, I hope sooner than later, such that we can actually create Thank you, safe Tina. havens and refuges for people who love liberty. And perhaps the only place left to do that is here in the Rocky Mountain West. But I issue that challenge to all of us. Let's not stop when this is over. Let's keep going until uh, America is exactly what it should be. Amen. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to close with prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for this evening and this opportunity to be together. We're thankful for good friends and good people. We're grateful for the Bundy family and for the blessings which thou hast bestowed upon them and upon us and the privilege that we all have to fight in this great cause of liberty. We're grateful for Roger who has sponsored this tonight. We ask a special blessing upon everybody here that they will be inspired and uplifted and blessed with experiences that will help them to bring about much good. We pray for our families and our friends and ask thee to watch over us all as we travel that we will do so safely and as we pray in the name of thy son Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks everybody. Uh, pretty great event. So we have the hundreds of folks here and the next one's in uh, January. John. Yeah, love you too, brother. Thanks. I have an aversion to myself. Let's see this uh, coming next <laughs> oh, week. Oh, no, here. we will. We mm -hmm. will. You got a place yeah, to stay. Uh, you told me that. I'll yeah, give you that. You know what you get to do? <laughs> you get to help me turn my stuff up. <laughs> Still recording, guys. <laughs> yep. Vincent Easley, the second on Facebook, and I'll put it Real Liberty Media. Uh, before you go, Real Liberty Media on the YouTube channel, all one word, Real Liberty Media. I'll, I'll, yeah, and I'll put it up there. Uh, By the way, I forgot to mention that everybody here who spoke should 
actually start putting like the last week. you know a message together that we can we can advertise and we can put it in the tribute you, know, you can all become ghost writers okay so if you would like to just remember 783 7830711. 702 area code here in Las Vegas. Yeah. And if you want to call me directly, it's 702 Okay. And you have uh, uh, the next uh, meeting here will be in January, the date you remember? I don't know what the date is yet. Okay. And this is the uh, Lysander Spooner Institute uh, in the Asian Cultural Center. That's correct. 333. Yes. Uh, is South, this for South Sixth Street? Sixth Street, yes. Yeah. Behind the federal courthouse. Right in the back of the federal courthouse. Thank you, Gerald. Don't forget, 9830711. Okay. Uh, now y'all call Lou. Lou Laker. That's right, Blue Laker. Blue Laker. So, um, if we already have. Let me say goodbye and thank you okay. so much for coming. <laughs> and did not sanctioned. Uh, Morgan Philpot, uh, co counsel with uh, 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 Dan Hill for Ammon Bundy. Still a free man. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to visit with you more. But it's great. <laughs> well, I, I have family from Shreveport. Really? So We're I don't know if that still counts. You know, if you're not, not far enough south, it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, Shreveport Thanks, counts. Thanks, Ray. Thank you very much. Awesome. It's a really a pleasure to meet awesome. you and, and very much okay. a pleasure to hear you speak. Thanks. So we're going to put this out. It's uh, live streaming right now on YouTube, awesome. and I'll put it up on the YouTube channel of Real Liberty Media. And, uh, I didn't get everything. My other phone ran out of space, so everybody I think we've got a good combination here. No, no, no. Real Liberty Media. Real Liberty Media. Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Appreciate it. And there's Jamie. Done an awesome job. Putting up streams during all of this. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. She is sees our mom and takes mom. care of us and brings us food. Oh, thanks. That makes me feel even older. Neil, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure, really. Hey, uh, are you on Facebook? Not really myself. No. Okay. I think I'm on Facebook. I, never, I haven't even looked at it okay. in months and months. Um, where, where can people make contact with you? If oh, they'd like to. My gosh. I, <laughs> You got to come to the protest. There, yeah, okay. That's about it. You know. All right. So I, I, I make comments on other people's Facebook pages and stuff like that. You know. For Mike, you know, but as far as back and forth contact, you know, you maybe one of those, one of like uh, American Patriots for a boy, those Facebook pages like that. You know. Or you write a comment there, and I can write one back to you, or something like that. Okay. Do you have that page set up? You can just get it. Uh, as far as I know, you just get on on the web and uh, type it in. You know, it's a Facebook page. Oh, you do have it then. It, it's. Well, I don't know. I have it. Oh. Access, access to it, you know, like how to get to it. You know. We can just uh, do a search I'm for a, Neil Wallace. I'm a real computer cretin. I, yeah. These things. I have a few of these things I do, but I'm not even too sure how I got started doing them. You know. So I'm. I'm <laughs> Not the person to really talk to about this stuff. Anyway. All right. Well, if anybody has any that. questions, then uh, contact me, and I'll, I'll pass them on to you when I see you next week. Okay, yeah, yeah. Would you do me a favor and take yes. a picture, Neil and I? Okay. Would you take a picture? Don't forget your goodies. He feel, so he feels bad about not coming, making come alone. Sideways or straight up down? It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I always ask for two. They don't seem to. They don't seem to understand. <laughs> Come on, smile, smile. Look at me. Look at me. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> You're welcome. One time I saw a picture of me and I thought I felt like. When did I get old? Thanks, Jerry. Stick to to bringing him. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate oh, yeah, it. Appreciate you. it a lot. Jerry Roots, uh, one of the amazing part of the uh, the legal team. Fifteen bucks for you, twelve. <laughs> Let's go.
say hello to Brandon and goodbye. Thank you. <clears throat> and David Fleeman. Hey guys. We have a round in the in the chamber. Thank you guys. And hit that decocking lever and it slams home with a round in the chamber. And it feels so wrong, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. And so anyway. Okay. We run this dog on the hunt till he's done. <clears throat> I think it's trade. So we're going to put the fire out. Call in the dogs. And so tomorrow at 12 noon, that's uh, every Sunday, 12 noon on the uh, left coast out here on the uh, Pacific side of the country, uh, we have at Real Liberty Media, RLMRadio.xyz, reallibertymedia.com. Uh, it's on the internet radio on tune in we have uh, Hal Anthony from behind the woodshed so I would like to take this moment and give you all my personal invitation to come over and tune in there's a chat room uh, Hal talks about a lot of this uh, jurisdiction and uh, identifying uh, the uh, the occupation that we're under and uh, we're there by uh, by consent or by our silence so come get the notice in the news tomorrow at noon, and uh, if not, uh, you can catch it a little later uh, in the evening over on the Real Liberty Media YouTube channel, and uh, where I do the post-production edit and put it up over there. Been doing for working with Hal for a few years, and I got to meet him on my trip this year. So I've been uh, around in the country since January, from Arkansas to Texas to Tennessee to Spokane. Washington down to stop off to meet Hal in Oregon, California, and now here to Vegas for about three months. And one of these days I'll go home. Uh, in the meantime, um, I, I'm a very small part of what's going on around here. Uh, I'm in the shadow of some great people. And I just can't say how proud I am to be a part of this and to add my small amount of my small voice into this uh, record and the history of this occupation that we're in. So thanks everybody and uh, I'll put this over to YouTube by, uh, hopefully by tomorrow. Okay. Love and peace folks. Bye bye.